Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Jackson, and I teach in the History Department and the Environmental Studies Program here at Rhodes, and I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of Rhodes College. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to thank everyone who helped to make this event possible, the Environmental Studies and Sciences Program, the Spence L. Wilson Chair in Interdisciplinary Humanities, the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Religious Studies, the Search Program, and the Rhodes Lecture Board, in addition to the Alumni Office's homecoming weekend. Are there any alumni in the room? One or two? Ooh. All right, welcome, welcome. Um, <clears throat> I also want to um, let you know that this talk is part of the Communities and Conversations series that we have here at Rhodes. And if you're interested, you can get one of these um, beautiful flyers out in the lobby uh, on the table. And let, I'm also going to let you know that the next talk uh, in the series that's going to be coming up is a talk by Darren McMahon. Uh, on November the 13th at 6 o'clock, he's going to be talking about his book called Divine Fury, A History of Genius. Um, Darren McMahon will draw in his new book, Divine Fury, A History of Genius, to explore what genius has meant and what it still might mean today by ranging across its understanding from the ancients to the moderns, from poets to the whiz kids of Silicon Valley. So that's November the 13th at 6 o'clock. And as I say, you can find out more information uh, out in the lobby. <clears throat> First and foremost, I want to introduce our speaker tonight, Jay Baird Calicott. As a Southwest at Memphis slash Rhodes College alumnus, class of 1963, where he earned his BA with honors in philosophy. He is celebrating his 50th class reunion this weekend with us, and we're so proud to welcome him back to campus, along with all the other alumni uh, this weekend. Dr. Calicut is also a native Memphian with deep ties to our community. His father, the painter Burton Calicut, taught at Memphis College of Art for many years, and Baird graduated from Messick High School in 1959 in the same class as Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn at Booker T and the MGs. <laughs> we won't expect him to perform, that, I don't know. That's the thing I'm proudest of, actually. So. <laughs> Your greatest accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> he left Memphis to earn his master's and his PhD at Syracuse University, but he came home in 1966 <laughs> to teach at Memphis State University. With the civil rights struggle heating up, Dr. Calicut became active in the movement and was serving as the faculty advisor to the Black Student Association at Memphis State in 1968 during Dr. King's assassination. That experience with civil rights led him to begin thinking about broader concerns, including environmental issues. And I would point out that in addition to the talk tonight, he will be also giving a talk tomorrow, uh, Friday at 3 o'clock, in Fraser Jelke B, uh, a talk titled From Civil Rights to Nature's Rights. This is part of the homecoming weekend. Um, and so it's open to alumni, but it's also open to Rhodes faculty, staff, and students. Um, and so come tomorrow, uh, FJB at 3 o'clock, if you want to hear more about his own personal transformation from civil rights activism to environmental ethics. Calicott came to believe that, as he put it, the environment was under wholesale assault from every direction with no surcease in sight. So he asked how, as a philosopher, I could contribute to a rethinking of human nature and a reconstruction of human values to help bring them into line with the relatively new ideas about the nature of the environment emerging from ecology and the new physics. When he arrived at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 1969, he found himself almost literally in the backyards of two of America's greatest environmental thinkers, Aldo Leopold, author of the Sand County Almanac, and John Muir. <coughs> Both men had lived only a few miles from where Calicut now resided. And this historical connection, as well as the beautiful setting, provided him with the perfect place to inaugurate a lifelong vocation as one of the founders of academic environmental philosophy. In 1971, he taught the world's first course in environmental ethics. He's continued to shape much of the conversation within that field ever since, working in areas of theoretical environmental ethics, comparative environmental ethics and philosophy, the philosophy of ecology and conservation policy, and biocomplexity in the environment, that work which has been funded by the National Science Foundation. He is currently University Distinguished Research Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Texas. That's a long title, <laughs> but well deserved, obviously. <coughs> Co-editor in chief of the Encyclopedia of Environmental Ethics and Philosophy, an author or editor of a score of books, dozens, uh, along with dozens of journal articles, encyclopedia articles, and book chapters in environmental philosophy and ethics. He has served the International Society for Environmental Ethics as its president, and he served Yale University as a bioethicist in residence. 
Callicott is perhaps best known as the leading contemporary exponent of Aldo Leopold's land ethic and is currently exploring an Aldo Leopold earth ethic in response to global climate change. His talk tonight is called Judeo-Christianity, Zen, Buddhism, and Environmental Ethics, and it is our great pleasure to welcome back to his alma mater, Dr. Barry Callicott. Well, I just want to say what a great pleasure it is for me to um, be back at my alma mater. This is my first sort of formal visit. Every time I come to Memphis, uh, which is not uh, infrequently, I always come to campus and walk around and reminisce and that sort of thing. So it's, it's good to be here on a kind of official basis. Um, so uh, I've been uh, given a very limited amount of time, so I want to uh, crash right into the uh, presentation here uh, and uh, begin to explain what the origins of environmental ethics uh, as an academic field of study is. As Jeff mentioned, I seem to have uh, taught the first college course. The first papers in the field uh, were published in 1973 through 1975 by Arne Ness, uh, a, a very distinguished uh, Norwegian philosopher, uh, Richard Routley, uh, an Australian uh, logician, and Holmes Ralston III uh, in the uh, United States. So this field sort of emerged spontaneously uh, in various parts of the world without much um, communication between the people who were beginning to work in the field. The first journal was established in 1979, and it was by Eugene C. Hargrove. It's called Environmental Ethics. Uh, that's the short title. And it, uh, it continues to be published and edited by Hargrove out of my home institution, the University of uh, North Texas. Uh, those are just some images of the uh, uh, people I mentioned, uh, that uh, shot of me was taken about uh, 10 years after I left uh, Rhodes College and my little boy there, Burton, uh, is about, what, six years old or something like that. Um, the context of environmental ethics as a field of study uh, was obviously the environmental crisis, which we really didn't, didn't come into general uh, awareness uh, until the 1960s and it began to to uh, uh, increase in intensity with oil spills on beaches uh, rivers including the Mississippi River uh, polluted with municipal and industrial waste um, I remember uh, while I was a student here at Rhodes uh, some of us would go down to the river and hang out and you know, you just didn't dare put your foot in it because of the, uh, of the chemical uh, pollution coming from a, um, uh, a pesticide plant uh, on Jackson Avenue, just a few miles north uh, of the campus here. Um, then there was also some crisis literature, most famously Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, but also the quiet crisis by Stuart uh, Udall, who was the Secretary of the Interior in the John F. Kennedy administration. And the, in, the, the, the title is interesting. I think it was from this book that the crisis name for the environmental crisis was uh, borrowed. And one wonders, well, what is the loud crisis if this is the quiet crisis? And obviously, at that point in time, it was the threat of nuclear holocaust. So basically what uh, uh, Udall is doing here is saying that we're as much at risk from this, this slow environmental degradation as we would be from a nuclear uh, war. Maybe a little bit of a, an exaggeration, but as we face uh, global climate change in the 21st century and all of the things that uh, may uh, result from that, uh, he might have been prophetic in this, in, in making that kind of comparison. Then, this is a little hard for contemporary students to understand, but there were, there were actual campus activism during the 1960s uh, 
we were out in the streets <laughs> protesting and marching and, and uh, demanding uh, relevancy in the classroom. Here we were reading Shakespeare and studying Plato, all good things to do, while at the same time it seemed like the world around us was going to a hell in, in a handbasket, is that what we say? And uh, we wanted, we wanted to, to, for that to be addressed in our uh, classrooms. And I think that it is um, also important to realize that there was a profound psychological impact of the photos of a beautiful blue planet Earth taken in the late 1960s by the Apollo uh, astronauts. Uh, my friends used to say, oh, we're wasting all of this money on a moonshot. We should be investing it in cleaning up the inner cities. And my response was, oh, no, it was worth every penny because of the, uh, uh, for the first time, we were able to see our Earth as a whole and a beautiful and a unique living thing in a uh, uh, what I sometimes refer to as a desert of outer space. And then, of course, this all came pouring out, this, this sense of concern and energy uh, on the first Earth Day, 1970, which happened to be sponsored by the, the U.S. Senator from the state that I was then living in, uh, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so here are a few images, you know, that uh, uh, kind of um, uh, illustrate the points that I was just making. Now, in terms of the uh, development of environmental philosophy as an academic field, it's my opinion that a notorious, and I would even go so far as to say infamous, uh, article by uh, Lynn White Jr. titled The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, which was published in Science in 1967, was the intellectual stimulus, I know it was for me, for the development um, of this field. So White's, when I say notorious and infamous, basically he was laying the blame for our, what he called the ecologic crisis, the environmental crisis at the doorstep of the Judeo-Christian worldview. So this was his argument, basically, that obviously, uh, our environmental problems stem from modern technology, pesticides and, and heavy industry and machinery and, and so on. Uh, uh, but that technology itself, he was a historian of technology, is as old as humanity. I mean, flaked stones and sharpened sticks are a form of technology. Modern technology is the culprit. And it is what makes it modern is that it's informed by science, which had previously been a knowledge for knowledge sake sort of activity by the aristocracy. And uh, technology was more of a yeoman's work and these two areas did not really coalesce until uh, the democratic revolutions in the 17th and 18th uh, centuries. So, um, an aggressive sign, uh, technology and, a, and the scientific revolution began, he argued, in Christendom in Western Europe in the late Middle Ages. Now that itself is a problematic claim, but that was nevertheless the argument. And what was the dominant world view at the, at the point of the emergence of both science and aggressive technology? It was the Judeo-Christian worldview uh, set out in the Holy Bible, therefore, he argued the historical roots of our ecologic crisis are traceable to the Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. So here then was the argument, um, or this, this is the big picture as it's set out in uh, Genesis. Um, God creates the world in the course of six days. On day one, there's light, day and night. Day two, the firmament firmament, which is the opening between heaven and earth. Day three, dry land and seas emerge, plants, grasses, herbs, and trees. Day four, sun, moon, stars, planets. Days, seasons, years, time. Day five, the animals, fish, fowl, whales, cattle, creeping things, beasts. This is all the language of the King James Version, which I'm 
especially fond of. Uh, and then day six, man. And in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, we read that man is created in God's image to have dominion over the animals, both male and female, created in the image of God. God commands them first to be fruitful and multiply, second to replenish the earth and subdue it, and third to have dominion over every living thing. So um, there we have uh, God creating man on the, depicted on the Sistine Chapel. Um, and so then the question becomes, how does the Judeo-Christian worldview uh, inspire aggressive technologies? Well, it, it's, it seems that in White's view, it's just that Christians lived out these commandments to have dominion over the creation and subdue it. And so that obviously explains uh, the development of aggressive technologies. Uh, and White cites some examples from the Middle Ages uh, in which uh, that's taking place. Now, how the Judeo-Christian worldview inspired science is a little bit more subtle a question um, because we usually think of science and religion at odds with one another. Uh, but I think it's the image of God that explains the possibility and motivation for scientific knowledge. If God is the designer and artificer of nature and we are created in his image, then we should be able to discover the design principles God used to create nature. Newton, for example, described himself not as a scientist, this word hadn't been invented then, but as a natural theologian thinking God's thoughts after him. That's a direct quotation. So in our language today, we would say basically Newton and the other 17th century scientists set out to reverse engineer God's great machine, basically. And so that then becomes, in White's view, the origin uh, of the, the emergence of science out of the Judeo-Christian worldview. So White then goes on to blame the Judeo-Christian worldview for the environmental crisis. Uh, Science-driven technology uh, has, of course, many, uh, given us many wonderful things. We should ne never forget that. But it's also had uh, serious uh, environmental side effects. Now, these are some of the quotations from this essay. If so, White says, Christianity bears a huge burden of guilt. The Judeo-Christian worldview replaced nature wor worshiping old world paganism. So Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. We are superior to nature, contemptuous of it, willing to use it for our slightest whim. More science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecologic crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. Now you have to contextualize this. This was in 1967. People had never heard this before. It was all sort of new. Um, and, uh, but because this, this narrative that he creates is so lurid and, and, and uh, uh, to, to many people offensive, and also the scholarship was very cavalier, um, it, we fail to notice that there is a subtext beneath this rather, rather dramatic uh, central text here. Um, and that text is captured in the following quotations, or the subtext is. What shall we do, he asks. No one knows unless we think about fundamentals. Our specific measures may produce backlashes. What people do about their ecology or their environment depends on what they think about themselves in relation to things around them. What we do about ecology, the environment, depends on our ideas of the man-nature relationship. We must rethink and refill feel our nature and destiny. So this subtext is repeated throughout the essay as a kind of, as, as a kind of uh, theme to which he, he returns again and again. So how do you think that that's going to impact 
a young philosopher. Whose job is it to think about fundamentals? Philosophers, of course, that's who, right? So in the early 1970s, White made, and I know this is ridiculous, but White made some of us philosophers feel like only we could save the world from a worsening environmental crisis because to do anything effectively about it depended on first thinking about the man-nature relationship, or so White <coughs> insisted. So here was the, the agenda for a future environmental philosophy. First, critique our inherited ideas about A, human nature, B, nature, and C, the human nature relationship. Not all such ideas, of course, are biblical. What about ancient Greek philosophy? What about Cartesian dualism? What about Newtonian mechanism? Lockean private property, etc. If Newton was rethinking God's thoughts after him, the thoughts that Newton was thinking were not drawn from the Bible. They were basically uh, uh, retreads from uh, ancient Greek philosophy. So we have to look at that aspect of our uh, intellectual heritage as well. And then the second task is to think up new, better, more environment friendly uh, ideas about human nature, nature, and the human nature relationship. So White presented uh, environmentally concerned Christians and Jews, of course, with a sticky dilemma. Either abandon their religious beliefs or abandon their environmental concerns. That seems to be the place he left us. So theologians went immediately to work uh, their way between the horns of that dilemma, following up on White's suggestion to rethink our old religion. White made a stab at that by nominating St. Francis of Assisi as the patron saint of ecologists, which Pope John Paul II actually did in 1979. According to White, Francis tried to depose man from his monarchy over creation and set up a democracy of all creatures. The more powerful response, however, from Christian and Jewish environmental thinkers was to challenge White's interpretation of Genesis 1. So if we don't focus so narrowly on two verses, three verses, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and look more widely in the same text, and not even that much more widely, First, we find that after his day's creation work on days three, four, and five, God saw what he created was good. The earth itself, sun, sun, moon, planets, and stars, plants, and animals. Now, that could be interpreted as God conferring what we environmental philosophers began to call intrinsic value on the creation. It has more than use value for humans. And from what source? Well, by divine fiat. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty secure foundation. And second, being created in the image of God, God, uh, God entails responsibilities as well as privileges. We humans are entitled to use nature, yes, but not for our slightest whim, as he had claimed, nor certainly in ways that destroy or disfigure nature. Third, what does it mean to have dominion over the creation? It's a kind of a, not a very common word. Dominion basically means rule or governance, but there's a difference between despotic rule and beneficent rule. The creation remains God's, not man's, so the kind of rule that God intended was that of a steward or caretaker of a Lord's household and property. And I add here, you can think Carson the butler on Downton Abbey as a model of stewardship, right? Uh, with uh, Lord Crawley as uh, God in, in this case, right? So this stewardship interpretation of dominion is confirmed by Genesis 2.15, where we find God putting Adam, the first man, into the Garden of Eden to dress and keep it. Fourth, we simply have to ignore the part of God's commandment that enjoins man not only to replenish the earth, which we would think of as adaptive management today or ecological restoration, but also to subdue it. We'll just sweep that part under the rug uh, for purposes of this interpretation. So from the philosophical point of view, the Judeo-Christian stewardship environmental ethic is theoretically very elegant and it's eminently practicable. It solves 
the central and gnarly theoretical problem of environmental ethics, the intrinsic value of nature, simply by divine fiat. It solves the reciprocity problem in ethics. Why should we be nice to nature if nature is not nice back to us? And it's not. Nature and all its creatures have no moral responsibility to us. The image of God solves that problem. We're created in it and they're not. So we have moral responsibility to them, but they don't have any to us. And this is also an important, this is where the practicality aspect comes in. It's holistic. It's clear that when God is creating plants and animals, declaring them to be good, he's creating species, not specimens. So we can, in good conscience, kill and eat other creatures as long as we pr preserve and replenish their species, their kinds, which makes it very livable. You don't even have to be a vegetarian uh, under, the, um, under the aegis of this particular uh, environmental ethic. Now, of course, there are problems with the Judeo-Christian stewardship environmental ethic. It's, for, it's, it's embedded in the Judeo-Christian worldview. It requires subscribers to believe in God as portrayed in the Bible, to believe that God created the world, believe that man is created in the image of God. All of those are, are part of the worldview. The Judeo-Christian worldview is not consistent with contemporary scientific uh, thinking in which the Earth is a planet, not the center of the universe. The cosmos took shape over many eons, not in six days. Man is one of six species of great ape and has no privileged status. And not all religious people share the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's more or less shared by Muslims, but not by Buddhists, Hindus, J Jains, Taoists, Dao Confucians, etc. So it, it doesn't have universal appeal, and it's inconsistent with another major contender for our intellectual uh, uh, sympathies, and, and, and that's the uh, scientific worldview, of course. Now, White also stimulated comparative environmental philosophy. Before suggesting a way to rethink our old religion by adopting St. Francis of Assisi's theology, White hinted at what it might mean to find a new religion. He says, the beatniks, who are the basic revolutionaries of our time, show a sound instinct in their affinity for Zen Buddhism, which conceives the man-nature relationship as very nearly the mirror image of the Christian view. So I looked around on the internet and found a nice pic picture here of Allen Ginsberg uh, and his friends. The beat, they, they call themselves the beat generation, but uh, they're their, their detractors added the Nick aspect from Sputnik in the 1950s, uh, suggesting that uh, the beat generations were a little pink, if not uh, screaming red here. So um, anyway, uh, there was that uh, uh, bit. So uh, there soon followed essays like Dow Now by Houston Smith, who incidentally was um, a guest lecturer uh, when I was a student at uh, Rhodes College. He was. Um, a popular writer and uh, one of those people who were experimenting in the, in the spiritual potential of LSD. Uh, we, we know where that, <laughs> we know what happened there, right? But White had, White had rejected the prospect of finding a new religion and everyone converting to Taoism or Zen Buddhism because, as he says, Zen and all the others is as deeply conditioned by Asian history as Christianity is by the experience of the West, and I am dubious of its viability among us. But who is us, Kimasabi? White assumed that his audience, his audience to be limited to those conditioned by Western history, but the environmental crisis is global in scope. If Christian thinkers could tease a coherent and powerful environmental ethic out of the Judeo-Christian worldview for Christians and Jews, then might not thinkers in other religious traditions tease coherent and powerful environmental ethics out of the worldviews uh, uh, for their own communities of faith. So the comparative philosophy then got underway, environmental philosophy, about a decade uh, later. I got an NEH-sponsored uh, fellowship to a, a um, seminar 
for college teachers to learn something about Asian philosophy to introduce that into the curriculum, but I turned the tables on the hosts and persuaded them that they had something of value to contribute to uh, environmental philosophy, and they took the bait. So we organized a series of conferences uh, on the theme, Conceptual Resources for Environmental Ethics and Asian Traditions of Thought, and published some of the con conference papers and special issues of philosophy East and West and environmental ethics. And the best of those papers were collected in a volume titled uh, Nature and Asian Traditions of Thought that I edited with uh, Roger T. Ames. And there we are, and that's, uh, that's the uh, cover of the book. It covered these various uh, uh, traditions um, in Asian uh, philosophy. So building on the foundations provided by nature and Asian traditions of thought in my previous work in American Indian environmental ethics, I undertook a global survey of the potential for ecological ethics in the principal world religions and select indigenous traditions in a book titled Earth's Insights, uh, which has recently been translated into French, Japanese, and Spanish. So uh, that's sort of the list of table of contents. I won't go over that, but that's uh, the cover of that particular book. Now, comparative um, environmental philosophy matures in the late 1990s. Uh, the Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions held a series of 10 conferences in the space of three years, organized by this brilliant person named Mary Evelyn Tucker on religion and ecology. She brought leading thinkers from all over the world in each of these communities of faith to construct an environmental ethic from their conceptual, the conceptual resources of their religious worldviews. And so these were eventually, these. The select papers were published by, the, by Harvard University Press um, in a series titled Religions of the World and Ecology. So why comparative environmental philosophy? As old Lynn, now I like to call him old Lynn White Jr. I don't know how long he's been dead, but probably quite a while. Uh, as he long ago noted, it is quite unlikely that we will ever convert to Hinduism, Buddhism, or Taoism. Uh, that the West, Europe, and Neo-Europe, as one scholar calls it, will adopt one of these foreign worldviews. But as anyone who has traveled West, South, or East Asia will attest, those people's cultures and civilizations could use an environmental ethic quite as much as the people's cultures and civilizations of the West. So a Hindu environmental ethic is for Hindus and a Buddhist one for Japanese and, and so on. Um, but then we confront what I call the one many problem. Uh, the environmental crisis is global in scope. Many, if not most, of our environmental problems are transboundary. They trespass geographical boundaries, political boundaries, cultural boundaries, and so on. All these religious-based, religion-based environmental ethics are embedded in very different, and as one student in a class I uh, tended today pointed out uh, their mutually contradictory worldviews. God doesn't exist, for example, in Buddhism and Taoism, and for Taoists there is the impersonal Tao or way, for Buddhists there is ultimately the holy sunyata or, or emptiness. So all these religions are not saying the same thing in different words. There is no common denominator of belief running through them all. But to be effective and successful, all of them have to work together in perfect harmony to meet the challenge of the environmental crisis. Now, there is, however, a common international belief system that is, as, uh, 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 that, that is global in scope as the environmental crisis, and that's international science. Um, Science may have originated in Western Christendom, as White claims, but it has now become thoroughly international. Scientists studying volcanoes in Beijing, New Delhi, Osaka, Berkeley, Lisbon, Mexico City, anywhere in the world share a single worldview, a single epistemology, the scientific method, a single set of criteria for distinguishing good from bad science, 
and communicate with one another around the world in a common language, mathematics, and by the way, also English, uh, by means of international conferences, peer-reviewed journals, and increasingly via the internet. Now, it's my view that science tells us a new story about the nature of nature, human nature, and the relationship between humans and nature. And this may sound to you like a, 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 an unusual claim, but I think that science, the scientific story, is just a story among stories. It's, it's an invention of the human mind. It's constantly changing. Uh, and so it's like the story told in Genesis or in the Bhagavad Gita. It tells us about the origin and structure of the unimaginably vast and old universe, about the formation of the earth, about the evolution of life on earth, about the way life on earth works ecologically, and about also about human evolution. So I say the science story is just a story among other stories, but it is better than those other stories. Why is it a better story? First of all, it's logically self-consistent and deliberately so, while the other is often not. Notice when I pointed out some of the details in Genesis. If you look closely, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not consistent uh, with one another. They're, they're amalgamations of two different stories, and we find similar inconsistencies throughout, I think, most uh, religious worldviews. And it's a story that comprehends all the known facts of observation collected with telescopes, microscopes, magnetic resonance imaging, imagery, and so on. I was talking, uh, giving this lecture actually on my home campus, and a number of the students, this was largely a science student audience, uh, were appalled to think that science is just a story. It's a fact. But there are facts. Facts are the things that we can observe. What science does is organize these facts into some sort of coherent whole. I'm talking about the theoretical aspect of science. And it is also, which makes it a better story, self-correcting. It's always in a process of revision and re-editing as new facts and data uh, are discovered. So there is a science-based environmental ethic, and it is the one that I have personally championed for the past, I don't know how long, maybe 30 years or so, uh, developed by Aldo Leopold. Leopold writes, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. In other words, why do we human beings have ethics? It's because we pursue life's struggle collectively in, and cooperatively. We cannot survive as individual animals. We have to live together. And we cannot successfully live together unless we are able to restrain our aggression and our competition with one another. And that's what ethics does. It enables us to live in cooperative communities and pursue the struggle for existence collectively. So all ethics, Leopold quite accurately summarizes Darwin, and this is basically Darwin's idea, are, are, uh, uh, we have them because we are members of a community of interdependent parts. Ecology, Leopold says, simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. So what then does a land ethic do? It changes the role of homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. And the, 
the golden rule, if I can make that comparison, the summary moral maxim of the land ethic is a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Now, so I'm suggesting here that the Leopold land ethic may serve as the Rosetta Stone for all the world's religious-based environmental ethics. It can be the arbiter when their indications are in conflict. Secondly, science can validate the ecological insights that are so well preserved in indigenous traditions of thought that we call it by an acronym, T-E-K, Traditional Ecological Knowledge. In many cases, ecologists get it wrong and they go among indigenous people and are astonished to find out that they understood this all along. And so there's a process of mutual validation uh, in that case. And furthermore, the language of science is abstract, mathematical, and it's inaccessible to most lay people. While the language of traditional religion is vivid, concrete, and metaphorical, thus religious vocabulary, imagery, and parable can help tell the new science story and the moral of that story, the evolutionary ecological land ethic, to the general public. And this is what Leopold is trying to do in his great work, A Sand County Almanac. He's trying to express a scientific worldview in terms that everyone can understand, many of those terms themselves drawn from uh, the biblical narrative. Um, so there's also, I think, a little explored uh, religious potential of science. And Aldo Leopold also sensed that there was an untapped spirituality in science. This is another quote. So this is a century now since Darwin gave us the first glimpse of the origin of species. We know now what was unknown to all the preceding caravan of generations, that men, people, are only voyagers, fellow voyagers with other creatures in the odyssey of evolution. This new knowledge should have given us by this time a sense of kinship with other creatures, a wish to live and let live, a sense of wonder over the magnitude and duration of the biotic enterprise. That the evolutionary process has no goal or direction or any exalted place for it for Homo sapiens is no cause for despair, I think. Rather, we should exult in our good fortune and take pride in being the most recent experiment in a process that began three and a half billion years ago. Now, this latent religious potential of science has been expressly developed by the Catholic theologian Thomas Berry, teamed up with physicist Brian Swim to write a new universe story, as they call it, as an alternative to the Genesis story, expanding Leopold's spiritual reflections on evolution and ecology from the planetary to the cosmic uh, proportions. Um, Brian Swim teamed up with Mary Evelyn Tucker, whom I mentioned before as this organizing genius who created these 10 world scale conferences on religion and ecology in the space of three years and published their fruits in a Harvard University Press series. They now have, and this is very new, and I hope that some of you will take an interest in it and show it here on campus, a, a PBS quality, uh, a documentary film called The Journey of the Universe. Um, it's done well, it's won many awards and so on. So here's my conclusion. And since I started 10 minutes late, I'm gonna hit the time on the money. Uh, Lynn White Jr. stimulated the development of religion-based environmental ethics with his critique of the environmental implications of the Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. Judeo-Christian apologists responded with the intellectually elegant and powerful Judeo-Christian stewardship environmental ethic. White also suggested that there might be the potential for environmental ethics in Zen Buddhism, which stimulated the development of environmental ethics in Buddhism and many other Asian traditions of thought. 
Religious pluralism and environmental ethics might be unified by making a Rosetta Stone out of the science-based land ethic of Aldo Leopold, and the science-based land ethic it's, is itself one of many religious environmental ethics because there is a spiritual potential in science that he tapped into and that has been more recently explored by Thomas Berry and uh, his uh, disciples. All right, well, thank you very much for your kind attention. And And, and let, let, me, let me say again what, what a delight and a pleasure it is for me to be back on this campus and having the opportunity to make a presentation to this uh, intellectual community. Thank you very, very much. Yes, sir. No, the other way around. That was that. That's exactly what I wanted to say. Science is abstract. It's mathematical. It's full of jargon. Nobody understands what the hell they're talking about. Sometimes not even even them themselves. Right, especially if you. If, if you migrate at all out of your own discipline. So what we need is, is to draw on the vivid and concrete and metaphorical language of religion in order to express the story that science is telling, you know, to, in, in the large picture. And Leopold was trying to do that in a Sand County Almanac, and I'm suggesting that Thomas Berry, a Catholic theologian, uh, he's probably on the index for, <laughs> as thanks for his work, but uh, in it, like, like Teilhard de Chardin, but uh, 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 if we can, if we can, if we can ask religion to help express the new story that science is telling, then that seems to me to be a good partnership. You know, we don't really, and and the the way I think environmental uh, philosophy and ethics is is tending these days is increasingly environmental justice, which doesn't really focus on the human nature relationship that that those of us who are long in the tooth and gray in the beard uh, have spent most of our time thinking about. It focuses on on human-to-human -human relationships in which environmental harms and benefits are unequally distributed, right? And indeed, there is not only a, a, um, a, a kind of social and economic analysis here, there's also a racial uh, dimension to the, to, to the discourse uh, in, in, in environmental justice today. So, a lot of, there are a lot of my colleagues, and I should emphasize younger colleagues of mine, uh, who are, are theorizing uh, environmental uh, justice. And it, it goes into several dimensions, not just the inequitable distribution of environmental harms and benefits, but also in terms of uh, representational justice. Who, 
who gets to sit at the table and whose voice can be heard and so on. So I, I, I can't argue with you. Yes? Um, how does the current uh, capitalist economic climate with all of its inherent assumptions and historical structures, specifically exploitation, um, fit with Within an economic, uh, I'm sorry, within an environmental ethic, or even does well, it? Well, it, it is. It, it, it's obviously the uh, source of a great deal. I mean, the object, I should say, the target of a great deal of criticism uh, from e another sector of environmental philosophy. Let's just let me just try to respond to both of these questions by saying that I was telling you about the origins of environmental ethics, how it got started, and with a specific sort of religious theme here. But it, it, it's become very, very diverse and pluralistic. In addition to environmental justice, there's also something called ecofeminism, a feminist analysis of environmental issues, a Marxist analysis of environmental issues. That's usually called social ecology. And they have their journals and, and uh, a discourse and so on. Now, one of the sort of interesting, and some of you may think futile, things that are going on sort of in the mainstream, not so much in the mainstream of environmental philosophy, but in the mainstream of economics, is to try to um, give a, a, an accurate cost accounting of the, the uh, environmental impact of some of our practices. Uh, that's called um, contingent valuation or shadow pricing because the actual costs and benefits have not been, are not reflected in the market. So it's a sort of non-market valuation. And this has received official sanction in a UN-sponsored uh, initiative called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, in which they, they expressed all environmental values in terms of services, which can then be, the economists call it, valuated, or, uh, and then we see exactly what nature's free services are worth in comparison. So there's an effort, in other words, not to critique the prevailing econo global economic regime, but to harness it in order to, to uh, uh, make us aware of and take account of the actual costs of our environmental abuses. As you obviously pointed out, that first article in Science, announcing the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, was based on a terribly shallow reading of the Bible. Cavalier, I call it. Yes. I, I see very little that goes back and delves into religious tradition or religious texts with any depth at all. Yeah. And I can't resist quoting the basic line that you, certainly your circles must have run into when you were in college the same time I was in the 60s. Some, let's just go to Deuteronomy. When you make war on a city, do not cut down the trees of thereof. It's right. the tree of the field man that you should make war on. It. The basic prohibition of Agent Orange. Does everybody know what Agent Orange is? <laughs> that was uh, a notorious uh, defoliant uh, herbicide that uh, the United States uh, sprayed on the jungles of Vietnam in order to deprive the Viet Cong of hiding places. And it's had terrible del deleterious effects, not only on the Vietnamese, but also on the American soldiers who were exposed to it as as well, so that's that's a well taken. Uh, uh, I, I would love to see science pay more attention to some of the old biblical principles. I mean, religious Muslims and religious Jews have known for centuries that if the cow is too sick to eat, you don't too sick to walk, you don't eat it. But I think the <laughs> FDA only noticed about three or four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. 
Yeah, that's good. By the way, I, I, I would like to say that uh, one of my recent uh, doctoral students who successfully um, completed his doctoral degree at the University of North Texas, a public institution, is also the president of the Tyndale Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, which is an evangelical, fundamentalist, literalist, uh, Bible uh, college, essentially. And he wanted to do precisely that, that to um, try to do an environmental ethic that would appeal to his community of, um, of people who read the Bible very closely and take it very seriously. So, so uh, that, that's good. He, he's gotten his uh, dissertation published and, and everything. So I'm really proud of him. Yes? Is, is environmental ethics heading towards something or away from something? How does it end? Is there a, I can see with different religions that uh, it, it might be a different worldview. Well, as I say, environmental ethics is very pluralistic, so it's very difficult to say where it's headed because it's headed in a lot of different directions. Environmental justice, uh, environmental economics, or uh, e Ecofeminism. Um, it's 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 a it's become very pluralistic and diverse, and and I feel very proud of that. I mean, when we started out with just a handful of us, and we did not get support from our discipline. Philosophy is an extremely con uh, conservative, narrowly uh, uh, focused discipline, and we were way out of the box and. Um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, marginalized. So over this period of time, it's become really quite vigorous. It just won't go away, but it's also become quite diverse and, and pluralistic. Now, in my opinion, one new and extremely important direction of environmental ethics is now called climate ethics. And that's the subject of my book that's actually just about to be published in November titled Thinking Like a Planet. Um, I think that uh, global climate change has, as I like to put it, has both eclipsed all of our previous sense of what environmental problems are because it is so such a huge threat, but it's also entrained them all. For example, many of us are uh, concerned about the loss of biodiversity, but biodiversity loss will be exacerbated by global climate change because animals are losing their habitat and some may not be able to migrate to where their habitat has migrated to, if it's migrated anywhere, and so on. So that's been, that's, that's a, a sort of um, uh, area of environmental ethics that emerged very weakly in the early 1990s, but is, as you can imagine, extremely um, robust uh, right now. In fact, um, I just got um, a proposal um, that, uh, that, that's been endorsed by the National Science Foundation to gather an interdisciplinary group to um, see if we can identify what actually motivates people for collective action where climate change is concerned. Because if you decide to bike instead of drive, that's not going to have a, 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 any significant impact. It has to be all of us together acting collectively. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, so far it's been mysterious as to what actually gets people uh, to take this seriously and do something. So that's going to be the subject of my next research project. Yes. Y yes. It seems to me that one of the problems uh, shared by both uh, religion and science, perhaps the foundation problem, is that both are narrative. And narrative is constituted of language. And uh, language by its very logic uh, is exclusionary, exists in the hierarchical form 
uh, exists um, in order, words exist in order to separate um, meaning. So it seems to me language itself will have to be interrogated um, if one is serious about undoing both the categories which have been which have enabled the discriminations which make Western development, not only Western development, excuse me, uh, all kinds of development possible. Um, and language itself, um, not only its um, Manichean morality of right and wrong, uh, 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 attractive and ugly and uh, healthy and unhealthy and human and animal and male and female, all of those categories, if one is serious about creating a holistic ethics, uh, language itself needs to be interrogated. And part of where I do see that happening is in a critique of even eco-feminism, and that is from queer, feminist, uh, queer uh, environmentalists, who <laughs> insist that the categories themselves are foundational in the exploitation of their <laughs> That, that's, a, that's an extremely, uh, I think, uh, interesting ob observation. Uh, and uh, also where I think that this, this uh, interrogation of language is taking place is, is in comparative environmental philosophy. For example, I have a colleague in, in, in Paris who is a Japanologist and he studies Japanese language and culture and that sort of thing. And a recent paper of his is suggesting that uh, in the Japanese language, there is a de-emphasis on the subject and a greater stress on the predicate, and the, uh, the, the, which is c consistent to some extent with Buddhism, which sees the self as ultimately empty sunyata, and that uh, there is a, a, a kind of, instead of a, a binary kind of logic, there is a, a, a modal logic with four modes. It's, it's uh, A and not A, uh, not A and A, uh, and neither A nor not A <laughs> as, as a uh, uh, and with and he's giving this some sort of formal expression, you know. So I think that that's 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 a very very astute observation. Yes. We have time for two more questions. Yes. Similarly, uh, I wanted you to reiterate the importance of language in like the Sang County Almanac. Yeah. And elsewhere in, in getting the point across to certain. As we were discussing in class today, is that <laughs> okay? Uh, what, one of the things that I have noticed about Sand County Almanac is that Leopold has uh, called on biblical turns of phrases and biblical tropes in order to give his message authority. Uh, in the 1920s, he was a close student of the Bible, but not for devotional so much as rhetorical purposes. And so uh, the way he turns phrases uh, resonates very deeply and subliminally with what I call our, our Sunday schooled ears. Uh, so that I think has been the one reason for the great success of this work which was written, after all, in 1949, and it's still, you know, selling like hotcakes, and uh, there are, are communities of uh, people all over the world now who are, are relating to this, this particular text, and I think that that's one reason. And the pivotal essay is Thinking Like a Mountain, which basically, if you look at it closely, is um, it, it's an environmental version of Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, Leopold is persecuting wolves. He tells the story of shooting a wolf, and first he hears the voice, the howl of the wolf as Paul hears a voice, and then the, one of the most famous phrases, he says, we got to the old wolf, 
in time to see a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. He sees a light and he then no longer is a persecutor of wolves as Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He becomes an advocate. Uh, what is Paul? He's a, dis not a disciple, uh, apostle. apostle. Uh, Leopold is the, is the apostle of, of big fierce predators uh, they are after. And so I think that, that we having this built into our, our DNA, basically, uh, that when we read something like that, it, it triggers this, these soteriological sorts of feelings that uh, we, we learned at Sunday school. One final question. Jonathan? Um, you mentioned that the Jonathan? I guess I want to go to the, the point in the talk where you sort of said that science and religion are both stories. Yes. Because it seems to me that not all stories tell the same kind of tale. They have very different sort of um, um, meanings. And I, I mean, I think at that point you kind of equivocate a little bit around the issue of what, um, what constitute the narratives. Because for most of religious history, of course, whether you were Christian or Jewish, um, uh, you referenced the Judeo-Christian tradition, nobody read Genesis as if it was a, a, a literal account of um, the creation of the world. Through most of religious history until the beginning of the 20th century, these things were read allegorically, right? And in part, it really was much more about this relationship between what are human <coughs> beings, what is nature, what is the human nature relationship, what's that in terms of the relationship to the divine. Science is a completely different kind of story. I mean, it provides accounts of, like, you know, of, of, of creation that are not necessarily the same kind of account as what we get in, in the biblical narrative itself. So I don't know if you're responding to kind of fundamentalism as a, as a, as a way of reading the Bible or or what it is, it, in other words, the pitch was, shouldn't we use the language of religion to tell the story of science? But what if we just say, in fact, these are very, these are in fact different kinds of narratives attempting to provide different kinds of meaning making. In fact, maybe science doesn't even have a meaning making aspect to its story. And that's precisely why we read the Bible and why it tells a different kind of story from science. Well, all, all I can say is I went to Messick High School uh, here in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, believe me, uh, everybody there except me took the story quite literally. Uh, and uh, now I live in Denton, Texas. Uh, and <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I, Jonathan, I understand what you're saying, I, you know, and However, and I may be an anomaly in this regard, but it, it, it's impossible for me to, let's say, read the Genesis narrative or read the Hesiodic narrative about the origin of the universe. I can see in it a temporally uh, localized, that is to say, these were 5th century BCE or so, these narratives were created. And it made sense to people then, but now we have an, a, a very different account of exactly the same questions that were being asked. Where does all of this come from? Hesiod says, that the world was given birth to rather than created. Uh, and now we have like another way of looking at this that comprehends more facts of observation is I trust the, the cosmologists have their logic and mathematics right. Uh, and they provide 
me with any in any case uh, a story that I can take much more seriously than the ones that were created 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Let me remind everybody to grab your meetings and conversation uh, information out uh, in the lobby so you can find out more about this lecture series. And let's once again thank Mary Callahan.